Of course, if you haven't done so yet, just make sure you pause the video. Try to question on your own first before listening on. We have set up four steps in order to help us find the volume of this solid of revolution. The first step is to sketch the region that is enclosed by the given graphs. So let's take a moment to sketch these curves right here. It's usually easier to graph first the horizontal and vertical line segments represented by these equations, and then we'll talk about how to graph y equals 1 over x. So here are the three horizontal and vertical line segments. The fourth graph was y equals 1 over x. Perhaps the easiest thing to do is to plug in x values that lie between x equals 1 and x equals 4, including x equals 1 and 4. For example, if we plug 1 in for x here, we would have 1 divided by 1, which would give us a y value of 1. So when x is equal to 1, the y value is equal to 1. We would have a point right here. When x is equal to 2, we would have a y value of 1 half, and so that y value would lie right about here. And then when x equals 3, we would have 1 third, and when x equals 4, we would have 1 fourth. So these points get closer and closer to the x-axis. We may actually find it helpful to change our y scale here. So why don't we make y equals 1 up here, 4 units high. So then the point 1 comma 1 would actually lie up here. 2 comma 1 half would be here, 3 comma 1 third would be about here, and then 4 comma 1 fourth would be right here. So then our region will be more apparent, it'll be easier to work with. So there's the graph of y equals 1 over x, and in conjunction with the other curves we can see that it has created this enclosed region which we can color in in yellow, and that would complete step one of this question. We go up to step two, and it says to reflect this region over the axis of revolution. So we're going to come back down here, and our axis of revolution is the x-axis. So we're going to reflect this yellow region over the x-axis. So basically, you take each point, and you count down to the x-axis, and then count an equal number of units below the x-axis. So this point here, when reflected, would end up over there. This point would end up here, and so on. And so we get something to the effect of, let's see, so this is a little bit and one unit, so about there, and then about there. So then we connect those together, and we end up with our reflected region. In step three of these problems, we have to draw a representative disk. So we come back down here, we can pick po a point that lies somewhere in the middle of our region, so perhaps right about here, and from that point you're going to draw a circular disk. And it's, the circular disk is going to look something like this. And it's a three-dimensional disk, so we have to give it some depth here or some height. So we're going to try to draw a disk like so. So there is our representative disk. You'll notice that the radius of the disk would be measured from this point right here on the axis of revolution up to the edge of the disk. So right there would be our radius. And you'll notice that that radius is a vertical dimension. It's drawn upward. And, and so because it's a vertical dimension, it's drawn upward, that would make the radius a y value. So we can actually say that the radius is equal to y. As for the height of the disk, you'll notice it's a really teeny tiny height. This is a very flattened disk. The height of it is almost negligible. You'll notice it's horizontally drawn. And because it's horizontally drawn, it would take on an x value. But because it's so tiny, we don't say x. We actually say dx. And dx simply represents an infinitesimally small dimension there. So we can go back up and look at the fourth step here. It's to apply one of these two formulas for disks. Basically, if you're revolving around a horizontal axis of revolution, then you're going to be using the first formula. And if you were revolving around a vertical axis, you'd use the second formula. In this case, our axis of revolution is the x-axis, so it's a horizontal line. And therefore, we're going to be using the first formula here. So we would have the volume is equal to an integral from a to b of pi times a radius squared dx. 
we've already noted that the radius was equal to y. So we can actually come in here and replace this with y. And then a and b are simply the lower x limit of our region and the upper x limit of our region. So we can actually plug 1 and 4 in for the a and the b. The only other little tweak here that we have to do is to notice that we have y in our expression, but we're integrating with respect to x. So you have to go back and you have to substitute something in for y. Remember, the radius was the measurement drawn up to this blue curve right here. And that blue curve had the equation y equals 1 over x. So you can replace the y with the expression 1 over x. And what is nice about that is it will give you an integral that is now in terms of x. And that's what we wanted because we have a dx in our expression. So we can next simplify this integral and then we're going to evaluate it. Now 1 over x squared is the same thing as 1 over x times 1 over x, which of course is 1 over x squared. Also we can factor the pi to the outside. So we're going to have pi times the integral from 1 to 4 of 1 over x squared dx. To integrate this, we want to bring the x squared to the numerator, basically. So when you bring it to the numerator, you're going to end up with x to the negative 2. Now, of course, when you actually integrate x to the negative 2, you have to add 1 to the exponent. So this is going to become pi x to the negative 1. And then you have to make sure that you divide by the new exponent. So you'll divide by negative 1. And then we're going to evaluate this from 1 to 4. We may find it useful to actually take x to the negative 1 and move it down to the denominator. So we would have pi over negative 1x, and now it's going to be raised to the positive 1. So we can just leave it as x like this. And again, we're evaluating this from 1 to 4. It's also usually easier to factor out the pi. So in fact, why don't we write pi times the quantity 1 over negative 1x from 1 to 4. Now we plug in the upper limit, which is 4. So we're going to have 1 over negative 4. And then subtract what we get by plugging in the lower limit. So that would be 1 over negative 1. Why don't we establish a common denominator here? We can multiply this by 4. So now we have pi times 1 over negative 4 minus 4 over negative 4. Now that we have a common denominator, we can subtract the numerators. So 1 minus 4 gives us negative 3 over negative 4. The negatives cancel. We're left with positive 3 fourths pi as the answer.